afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Tyler Burnell. I'm the marketing assistant here at Temple Communications. And uh, welcome to our webinar, Effectively Test and Troubleshoot FTTH Networks. We're just a moments away from this great content, but first we have a few housekeeping notes. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website, www.templecom.com in three to five business days. Uh, all attendees, all attendees are automatically on mute. However, we do invite you to use the chat box throughout this presentation. So we'll collect any uh, questions or concerns you have and we'll address them at the end of the webinar. So your presenter today is Keith Ford. Keith is a skilled engineer with over three decades of industry experience, and he's the product manager over Tempo's line of fiber optic test and measurement solutions. So uh, with uh, no further ado, take it away, Keith. Let's get started. Yeah, OK. Hey, hey, thanks, Tyler. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here, and uh, uh, we'll get started here. So everybody knows about fiber optics, and we've heard about it for a long time, and and finally we're here. This is this is the last mile is being deployed fiber to the home. This is when they're going to finally bring that fiber optic cable to your house. And uh, so now the onus is on you guys, the technicians, to get out there and to be able to install it and test and troubleshoot and make it work, OK? and so. Today we're going to have a bunch of tips and tricks and and uh, and some uh, OTDR uh, theory and and, and uh, trace interpretation to make sure that you know you you have some of the basics and and uh, uh, to be able to be successful because uh, that's the that's the name of the game is to be successful get the job done and uh, um, make everyone happy the customers happy. So it's all about bandwidth and uh, all these applications and. Uh, we never thought that it would be possible to do this today, you know, like even like you know remote working and doing a webinar uh, from my office here, and uh, uh, you just don't know where it's going to go. But you know, we're going to have to have uh, even more bandwidth, and it's definitely going to grow. And, uh, you know, the picture in the top right-hand corner there, I'm I swear it's my my neighbors. Every kid in the neighborhood has this kind of setup, and and uh, I'm using like a HFC network, and uh, I'm sure that. Uh, um, that's re the reason why my, my network slows down <laughs> because there's a bunch of kids playing games. So, no, you're not in the wrong seminar. This is not a fishing seminar, but uh, uh, you know, I'm just showing that uh, this slide here because spectrum, you think about it, it's it's all the way from what you hear, all the way to what you can see, and and uh, uh, what you can't see. Okay, and uh, of course, the light that we use with an OTDR or in the network that uh, uh, that we're we're installing, you can't see that light. Okay, it's infrared, but there's lots of radar applications, and and this is a bit of a teaser here. And so the first person who can really answer this question is why on my fish finder does it show two bottoms of the lake? So it's kind of the same idea as you have in an OTDR. It's a little radar application, and uh, you get these reflections, and, uh, and and then you interpret it. Okay, so we'll we'll get back to this. Uh, uh, fish finder slide in a little bit. So the last mile, it uh, is like defined really from the splitter to the network terminal, optical network terminal. And you can see this this picture here. I sure hope it's it's been insensitive fiber because the technician he they just wound that pretty tight, and it would cause a lot of losses if it, it was just standard single mode fiber. And uh, and 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 so uh, you know this is. Kind of the challenge is uh, uh, they're ripping out the copper, putting in the fiber, and so they have to, you know, there's a little bit of a learning curve and and whatnot. But uh, uh, here you can see, as we in the bottom left-hand picture, um, you can see how the fiber is progressively getting closer and closer to to me, the end user, right? So the transition from copper to fiber can be scary for some people, and and it doesn't need to be okay. Uh, uh, this this picture here is is a is a um, output from a um, our new TVE TV220E uh, TDR time domain reflectometer. It's a copper uh, tester for coax, right? And you can see there's a bunch of reflections and there's positive going events and there's negative going events. There's little wiggles and funny slopes and stuff like that. The 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 copper. Uh, Interpretation is much more difficult, and optics is so much easier because it's only a positive going event. And uh, 
uh, and so it's a little it's a lot a lot easier to interpret and, and there's not like I'm trying to make it so it's not so much fear involved here okay and and uh, once the fiber is is installed it just keeps on working and it's much more reliable okay you don't have the water issues and all that business so you know an optical time domain reflectometer now we're using optics not copper okay and it's really just a light collection interpretation instrument okay and everybody knows all these kinds of there's different instances of it like a, just a regular camera it collects light and then it shows it on the display your eye is the the ultimate instrument uh, the device for collecting light and interpreting it okay and uh and so if you think of it that way it's not so bad the otdr is not so scary now a few years ago i was in a uh, a lab in montreal and I found the very first OTDR that I built and uh, I'm standing there beside it and I was really excited to see it and you can see all the wires and buttons and, and all that and then and then what happened was the next generation of that equipment was simplified and still look at all those buttons okay this was this was a complicated instrument to run and to interpret the data but that that's no longer the case okay still the OTDR this these OTDRs that are shown in these pictures are very very powerful tools and these this little otdr here the ofl 100 it's just a regular otdr it's still a powerful tool okay but you don't need to be don't need to fear it like you had to like if you were running that otdr i showed you on the previous slide yeah you'd have some issues okay uh, there's a lot of things that had to happen and they had to happen perfectly to make everything work but now this class of otdr it's a single button operation and it's an all in one tool. You can see all the, 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 the 10 squares, I call it, all different little functions and, and whatnot. We'll go through a bunch of that kind of stuff, but this is how OTDRs have evolved, okay? Much simpler to operate, much simpler to, to interpret and to get the results. And it's become like a Swiss army knife. Many different features all put together to make your job easier. So we have a poll question, and Tyler, I'll let you take it over here for a moment. Uh, um, do you want to bring that poll question up? Here we go, guys. So this should just pop up on your screen right here. The question is, how do you most frequently use your OTDR? We'd love to know. So we'll give you a few, a couple seconds, a few seconds here, and uh, it, you know it's valuable information for us to understand what you guys are doing out there. So, um, Tyler. Let me know when you've collected the votes that you need. Just give a few more moments for uh, results. It's looking so far like the majority uh, use it to measure or troubleshoot the distance to a fall. Right. Very good. Uh, we'll continue on, so I'll move to the next slide, Tyler. Great. You know, I don't like to get into too many technical details, all the the uh, munitions of it and whatnot, but there's a couple of things we really need to talk about specifications and uh, dynamic range, event dead zone, and attenuation dead zone. It sounds scary, but it really isn't. And uh, uh, people like to say, oh, what's the dynamic range of this OTDR and that kind of thing. So we'll, we'll, I'll give you a, a fast rundown. And don't be scared about uh, formulas and whatnot because it really isn't is something that uh, is critical to your understanding. But the dynamic range is quoted at the widest pulse width, okay, of the OTDR. A higher dynamic range will allow you the OTDR to see through um, uh, longer distances and and uh, uh, and lossy events like a splitter or whatever, okay, something like that, or a bad connector. OK, you might be able to see through that a little bit, but uh, really it, it's it's just, you know, the the ability of the OTDR to to be able to probe deeper and further into the network. OK, and get through high loss components. That's all it really is. And you can see how the maximum power is related to the, the noise level of the, of the of the light and it's a logarithmic relationship. But everybody just says, oh, the DB, it's uh, 26 dB, and, and people understand what that is. 
Now, when you talk about the event dead zone, it's it's quoted always at the narrowest pulse width. OK, and it's the ability of the OTDR to be able to resolve between two reflective events. How close can those two reflective events be when when uh, uh, they're in the, on, a, on a piece of fiber? And typically like uh, one meter is the, the the industry standard kind of thing for that. And uh, uh, that's that's all you really need to know. But the confusion begins when you talk about the attenuation dead zone. And it's also quoted at the narrowest pulse width, but it's the ability of the OTDR to resolve between a reflective event and a non-reflective event, such as a bad fusion splice. And this is typically around four meters or so, something around that range. And and uh, this is the, this is the mathematics and the, the pictorial that uh, everybody refers to in the GR uh, 196 uh, uh, standard that's put out by Telcordia. And and uh, this is hopefully how all manufacturers are quoting their specifications. OK, in some cases that's not happening, but uh, um, you have to be very careful and read those carefully if you're really, really concerned about it. So this slide is the most technical slide and probably the most important slide for a technician to understand how to get the most out of their OTDR. And and so if you have a wider pulse width, the resolution goes down, but the dynamic range goes up. That's the ability, a wider pulse width will allow you to probe longer distances. A narrower pulse width will give you better resolution, but the dynamic range goes down, so then you won't be able to go as far, okay? Now, a lot of the OTDRs are using algorithms, of course, that uh, do a lot of this for you in the automatic mode. And we're, I'll talk about that a, a fair amount in a, a couple slides. But uh, uh, if you're using the expert mode, the traditional method, then what happens is you, you uh, uh, can change the pulse width. Okay, you can change that pulse width to be able to get that little bit extra of information from your OTDR. Signal to noise ratio, I think everybody understands that, that slide, uh, that concept, and, and uh, uh, more averaging time will give you a, a clearer picture of what's going on, okay? But a lot of the times when I'm shooting a fiber, I set it to 15 seconds and be done. That's pretty, pretty, it's a lot of time, a lot of data can be accumulated and give you a clear, pretty good clear in, indication of where you're at with, with the fiber. So you show up to my house, I have no internet connection, something's wrong, everybody's going crazy here and you're at the front door and you need to figure out what's going on so what are you going to do first thing you're going to do you're going to check the optical power right and uh um, you can see uh the optical power meter the the uh, power level minus 0.64 dbm that's a really really high level of optical power coming to my house let's say but let's say i had nothing there like maybe minus 40 or minus 50 that kind of thing, and and so like you you uh, uh, would know that there's a problem, but uh, uh, but uh, if you if you're getting no optical power, now you would use the VFL, and uh, the visual fault locator will find a like a damaged fiber or or a contaminated or uh, dirty uh, um, connector of some sort or macro bin perhaps something like that, and uh, this is the Swiss Army knife kind of um, situation I was telling you about. Uh, the OTDR has these kinds of uh, functionality built into it now, and uh, uh, it gives you the ability to to find a problem real quick. OK, and um, so let's say you can't figure it out with the VFL or the optical power meter. What you'll do is you'll measure distance to fault and in the auto test mode, it's super, super simple. You push one button. That purple button there you see on the screen, you push that one, it will it will set up all the settings for you. Okay, it will set the the range, it will set the pulse width, um, it will it will it'll t report back to you where the events are, what the events are, and uh, and so really it's truly simplified to the point where it's a single button operation. Okay, you just push the auto test. You can use the real time test or you can use the averaging mode. Averaging mode is the traditional trace uh, uh, accumulation of data. 
and uh, you could do it that way if you so desire. Uh, but uh, for the single button operation, you can send out a a, um, a pretty basic type of technician uh, as long as they remember one thing <laughs> to do. And uh, and uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit here, which is really, really important. But, you know, they have to they can they can make a measurement and they can figure out how far away that that uh, that event is. OK, and. Uh, um, there's different uh, methods of uh, showing that result, which we'll get to in a couple slides here. So the interpretation of it all. Here I have a, a, a trace and uh, event zero is uh, 2-0 is, is uh, the bulkhead. Uh, number one is some sort of bad connector. And event number two is the end of the fiber. Now, what's interesting here is event number one you can see the loss is 0.53 dB, and that's way too much for a connector. Um, the, the legal amount is like 0.3 dB. I'm kind of picky about it. I would say 0.1 dB is probably where you want to really be. But here you can see it's 0.53 dB, and that's way too high. But you can see the return loss, the reflection from it is minus 52. So that's not so bad, okay? That's okay, but really the loss is bad. Now, if you had, now this is a connector that I have in my lab here that uh, I, I uh, save so that I can get a, a, you know this kind of pictorial from an OTDR. But if I used a different connector that was highly reflective, that return loss would go to like, let's say minus 25. Now that would be a ridiculous reflection. You can't have reflections in your network that are like minus 25. That there is, is gonna cause so much trouble. And remember, reflections are the enemy of your network. If you have reflections in your network, you will have nothing but a world of hurt. Okay, and and uh, and so you really need to to uh, find those reflections, and the OTDR is the way to do it. Okay, and you can see in the traditional trace mode, you get a a very pictorial kind of uh, situation where you have a lot of data in your face. <laughs> you know, so much information there, and and so. Here, we, we kind of simplified a little bit and you can put it into the list mode and it lists the events. And so it doesn't overwhelm the technician, and, but it still gives that critical information of 0.53 dB. That technician knows it's a critical thing because 0.53 is, is, is in red, okay? They know they need to do something about that. And, and uh, uh, so the technician isn't gonna be overwhelmed with that trace just a, a standard list, okay? Now, there's also what we call the linear view, the, the event map. And you can see the start of the fiber, and then it moves on to that connector, and it shows a connector is the problem here. It shows a little uh, pictorial of a connector with a red X, you got a problem there. And then the end of the fiber is okay. It's not highly reflective by any means. So you, you can see you can have the curve of the traditional uh, in the in the banner at the bottom there, you see curve, list, and event map, and you can you can select whichever uh, mode of information conveyance you you so desire, and that is probably you know, kind of in line with what your technician is comfortable with. Okay. Now, remember I was talking about the the reflections being the enemy of the of the network. Okay, and here we have the fish finder again, and really what's happening in that fish finder is the transducer is sending uh, 200 kilohertz and 83 kilohertz down into the water and then that reflection for the those those frequencies are reflected back to the transducer and it interprets it and it gives me a pictorial so why is there two bottoms of the lake that is because so much energy is emitted down into the water and it's probably a hard bottom maybe rock that the first, the, it hits the bottom of the lake, reflects back up, hits that transducer, and bounces back down, and it's a ghost. It is a ghost that uh, is um, uh, shown on the screen. Now, with the OTDR in the left-hand picture, you can see event number one is the, the end of the fiber, and then we have a ghost. And that's because the APD, the avalanche photodiode in the OTDR, that's the detection device. It it um, 
um, is saturated. So much light is hitting that detector that so much current is so much current is being uh, drawn, like um, flowing through that detector that it becomes saturated, and it uh, it, it becomes um, uh, like blind to it. Okay, it becomes it, it becomes uh, very very um, uh, 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 it gives you a long tail, and it makes it so that uh, uh, there's the dead zone is very high. Okay, and so this is the same kind of effect between the fish finder and the and the the uh, the um, uh, OTDR. And so you'll notice that the ghost, which is there's always two times the distance to the from the last event, which was highly reflective, is not annotated. And 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 that's important because the OTDR is not saying, hey, we have two ends of the fiber, right? But the same thing happens. The light goes down the fiber, hits that huge reflection, the unterminated connector or a bad connector or something goes back into the into the OTDR, hits that laser facet, that mirror, and is emitted back out as a secondary pulse. And it may fool you, but the OTDR stops that from happening because the ghosts are not annotated. Okay. Here we have the optical power meter. You know, the, you, it's standard kind of thing. We talked about it a little bit in the in the previous slide, and uh, um, you can. Use it as a standard, a standalone power meter has tone and pro, tone frequencies, so that you can uh, use it with a perhaps a fiber identifier, or with a, um, you know, it, it will, will make sure that uh, you're able to sense those frequencies. With a vis visual fault locator, part of that uh, Swiss Army knife thing I was talking about. Of course, uh, this is um, um, uh, something that uh, um, is a red laser, and it can find those bad connections and macro bends and whatnot. Um, you can put it into CW mode, continuous wave, always on, or one hertz and two hertz. It allows you to see things better because a flashing light is more noticeable. Big thing about VFLs is that are the ones that uh, Tempo sells and other reputable suppliers are always class two compliant, and that's one milliwatt zero dBm, and it, it will provide safe viewing. Anything more than that can cause you permanent eye damage. Okay, and it won't happen immediately. In coming years, you will notice something is wrong with your eyes, and uh, you may have been exposed to high optical power levels. Okay, it's like your mom said when you were a kid: "Don't stare at the sun." Immediately, what did you do? He <laughs> took a look. But uh, the thing is, um, the visual fault locators are all uh, regulated by the FDA, and uh, by going against the Telcordia IEC specification, and uh, uh, Zero dBm, one milliwatt, is considered safe because your blink reflex, you'll turn away from it. You won't look at it, okay? And uh, it won't uh, cause you any damage. But when you're buying a visual fault locator by itself or an OTDR with a, with a VFL included, you want to make sure you're not buying anything but a class two device. And it's really important because that accession number is supplied by the FDA, and, and that is what really proves that things are safe. So just a little bit of a safety message there for you. A lot of people like to just connect their their OTDR directly to the field fiber. And you, you know, everybody's guilty of that, okay? But you should try to use a one meter jumper because it protects the bulkhead. It'll, it'll prevent you from repeatedly connecting to that bulkhead and every time you make a connection, there's a very good chance that you're going to damage that bulkhead. You would have to send it back to our our, um, our um, uh, repair facility in Vista, California, and now you're now you're without your OTDR. And you know we'd have to maybe polish it or replace that that uh, that uh, connector. And so the way to avoid that is just use a one meter jumper. And there's a lot of benefits to that because you know first thing you're going to protect the bulkhead finish. Next thing is, um, you know, if, if if you do damage the one meter cable, you can just throw that cable out. You can buy a new one for ten bucks, right? And and uh, um, it, it's so much cheaper than sending it back for repair. And instead of buying a bunch of adapters, like we we sell the OFL one hundred with a Sam Charlie SC, 
instead of buying all those different adapters like the Frank Charlie and LC and ST and whatever, you know, all these kinds of adapters, just buy a hybrid cable, you know, a hybrid cable, maybe 15 bucks instead of buying adapters that are like triple digit kind of things. Okay. And so like, I always recommend that people use that one meter jumper cable. So many benefits and it's a little bit of insurance and it's only 10 bucks. Well, when you, when you're out there and you're doing your testing and whatnot, you, you want to know what the optical return loss is for your network, right? And, uh, uh, and so you're, that's something that your customers want to know, okay? And uh, you, they want to know what the loss events are, the length and splices are okay, connectors are okay and all that. And uh, uh, the OTDR can do that for you, of course. And uh, it's saved as a, a standard operating report, an SOR file, again, defined by GR196 at Telcordia, and uh, um, it allows you to save that information. So report generation, and uh, I kind of scrunched it in here as best I could, but, uh, um, you know, it, it's it's when people call, call me up or David Lopez or one of the, the application engineers that we have, um, they say, oh, geez, I don't know how to interpret this OTDR trace or whatever. And this this OTDR trace that you see right now is pretty, pretty simple. But um, um, there, uh, sometimes I've seen some really, really funky things. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh, what did you do? I don't understand this and talk to the guy a little bit and figure things out. But it, you can see all the test settings are here. And it tells me exactly what you did, like the wavelength you used, the, the range and, uh, and everything. And uh, uh, it allows me to do a lot of troubleshooting. And it, this is something that uh, you know the customers like to have a, like to have a closeout report, right? So that you can say, yes, this is the fiber I installed. This is this is uh, really the the uh, um, the 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 situation, and uh, and then you can you know send it on to your customer, and of course then they 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 send the check, which is everybody's favorite part. And uh, but there's more benefit than this. Right now, when you install a fiber, it's clear, crystal clear. But in two years, you will not remember that fiber. And, and so you can go back and now you have a permanent record and you can see what it's supposed to look like. So when you show up and you do some troubleshooting, you know that it's 511 meters and you know that uh, uh, when you measure it, and let's say it comes out at 300, you know something's happened. And so it gives you a lot of clues of what's going on. Okay. Clean up. Um, this is probably one of the more important slides in any webinar, and and it's not optional. And and uh, if you don't clean, uh, nothing will work on the first day. That's for sure. Um, and uh, uh, over 80% of all failures are people they don't properly clean or they just plain don't clean. Okay. And uh, and and once you get a fiber up fiber optic network working, everything's working just fine, let's say, it's going to stay that way. It's not subject to water and all that kind of stuff, really, uh, like a copper cable. And and uh, usually it's because of some other person, another trade, or someone's gone in there and started messing around, or maybe a squirrel started chewing the fibers or something like that. Uh, but it really doesn't have the same kind of failures as copper. And and so if you clean, you you have very high certainty that things are going to be okay. Um, and and uh, cleaning is is not optional. And so what we we suggest here, you can see the 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 real cleaner that we have, the plea box. And what happens is, uh, when you're cleaning the fiber optic end face with the real cleaner, you're getting the entire surface, the entire end of the ferrule. Okay, that's being uh, cleaned and and uh, so that looks after the the connector end and uh, the bulkhead side is the is looked after with the swabs okay and again you can see those swabs fit perfectly into those bulkheads 2.5 millimeters or 1.25 millimeters if it's lc for instance and it cleans the entire fiber end face and a lot of people like to use the the one click pens and they click 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 and they and they they work okay but they don't clean the entire fiber end face, the entire ferrule. And so if you look at the pictures where 
the top picture is disgustingly dirty. And, you know, the, right on the core, it's clean. But what happens is with vibration and, and uh, removing it and then putting it back in, all those big clumps of dirt could migrate over right to where you were the, the active area of the fibers, which is only nine microns. And so you, you have to make sure that you're cleaning the, the entire ferrule and face. The little cleaning pens with a little string, it only cleans a small portion of it, okay? The, 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 the round circle, the, the, the donut part, okay? That there is clean, but all the, all off to the sides of the, the, the ferrule, not being cleaned, okay? And at the bottom, you can see a properly cleaned uh, fiber end face. And, and this is what you need to make sure is happening in your network. Um, because if you don't clean, what will happen is uh, uh, if things won't work initially, or they may work for a while. And then let's say you have a cabinet that's next to a, a busy street and the buses are rumbling along the trucks and that contamination can migrate. So um, it, then it stops working and then you have to bring out the OTDR, okay? And, uh, um, and, and find that uh, offending connector. So in summary, um, it's all about bandwidth, of course, and and we're trying to get you know a bunch of new technicians are coming to the into the job, and and uh, they have to learn. And uh, uh, webinars like this, I hope, help you guys and and uh, help you learn a, a few things. And um, and, and uh, uh, you know, there's new tools, and that's the newest the, the tool that is new to them is the OTDR optical time domain reflectometer. And we we uh, we're trying to get these tools into the technicians' hands so they can be successful, okay? And and that's what it's really all about. And and Temple Communications, we we're always stressing that you know we we're here to help you after the sale. We're going to make sure that uh, we we are are getting the tools that you need into your hands, but then we're there for for you afterwards, okay? And we can help you out and. Uh, it's all about technician success and uh, building that relationship. OK, and uh, so that's what I had for today. You can see technical sales and support in the, the UK and uh, in, the, in Vista, California, where our, our manufacturing plant is. So, Tyler, I think that uh, I'll throw it back to you. And if there's any questions, we can we can. Uh, yeah, answer. let's open it up to uh, if anyone has any questions. Now is the time uh, put them in the chat. Uh, and to start off, I do have one just kind of a FAQ type of question for Keith. Uh, why do I need a launch cable? Yeah, OK, launch cable. Well, with OTDRs, I could go on and on forever. OK, <laughs> and I wanted to keep it, you know, um, um, you know, kind of basic at the moment. Maybe we can talk about some other ones, but a launch cable is really important also because the launch cable will allow you to um, uh, get away from the, the to to minimize the effects of the dead zone. Remember, we're talking about the dead zone, and so the event dead zone, uh, as it as the OTDR, you start using wider pulse widths, the dead zone gets wider, and so now that dead zone can cover up the very first connector and some portion of the fiber at the beginning. And so, if you have an event that's in that's in within that dead zone, you will never see it. You'll never be able to characterize that very first event, and you'll never see the the any any reflections or bad connectors, for instance, um, um, that are hidden by that dead zone. And so, if you have a a launch cable that's 500 meters is probably what you need in the last mile and in short lengths like 20 kilometers. Uh, and and so, 500 meters will do it. And and uh, then you'll be able to to be able to avoid the the dead zone of the of the OTDR. Now that's about a launch cable. Now there's also you can use a launch cable as a receive cable at the other end, at the the end of the end of the fiber, and and that's useful because um, it, it allows you to characterize the insertion loss and return loss of that last connector okay that may be at my house okay um, from the other end of the splitter and and uh, um, you know it it's uh, 
That's important too, because you want to make sure it's not reflective because reflections are the enemy of your network. And if there's a high insertion loss, that, that MP that uh, you know, eats up a lot of your loss budget that, uh, that uh, um, is, is um, you know, very precious. <laughs> you don't want to be losing too much, too much signal. Every connector, if you lose half a dB, you, you do that like for five connectors and you, you almost lost half your signal. Um, and and that, that's something you want to avoid, that's for sure. So yeah, you need to have a launch cable and a receive cable, and you have to make sure that you treat those connectors very, very well. You have to make sure they're clean and you inspect them and all that, because if you mate a contaminated launch cable to your to your to your uh, fiber under test, that that connection there is going to be highly reflective, and so now you won't be able to characterize that very first connector. So you have to be very careful and clean those those launch cables properly and, and protect them. Okay. Great. Uh, good answer. Uh... And again, just as uh, as Keith is talking, you can leave questions in the chat. We'll get through them uh, one by one. So we have another one loaded up here for you. Is uh, what is the return loss of a good APC connector? Okay, uh, APC connectors are green. Okay, and they're angle polished like eight percent. And because of the fiber geometry, uh, what happens is any reflections that hit. Will not be accepted back into the fiber and 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 that's important because like i was saying reflections are the enemy of your network and so you um you want to make sure that uh, uh you know you're using angle polish in, in these these fiber home installations and and so if you have a mated apc connector and they're clean and not uh, 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 damaged at all, they could be minus 70, it could be minus 80 dB down, okay, like really, really far. You'd never see anything like minus 70, minus 80 with the, with the, with the class of OTDR that we're talking about here. Uh, and uh, you need to have like a, a lab grade instrument to be able to see that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, like if it's a good connection, you'll be okay. You'll never see it minus 70, minus 80. But an open APC, typically, yeah, you're probably looking at minus 55, something like that. But if it's contaminated and you have a clump of dirt on the end of that, right by the, where, the, the, where the, 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 the core of the fiber is, you could see minus 40, you know? And so that's why you have to make sure things are clean and terminated. You wanna make sure, even though a APC is is uh, uh, a connector is not very reflective compared to a UPC like a blue one. You want to make sure it's terminated because you never know the con contamination can get in there. Dust caps are notorious for containing dust. Okay, and 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 uh, things can happen like dust can migrate. With, like I was telling you about the bus situation along the side of the road, and and so you know what works one day could not work the next day, and uh, and so. To answer your question, um, Tyler, there, um, you, typically you're you're looking at something like like that's minus 60, minus 70 if it's mated properly and clean. Okay. Great. Uh, we have a few more here. Uh, mm -hmm. How long of a cable can the OFL 100 measure? Um, the OFL 100 can measure up to like 160 kilometers. Okay, that's quite a ways. Now, like um, with a with a uh, with the OFL 100, the loss of fiber is something like a standard single wall fiber is 0.3 dB per kilometer, and so there's enough dynamic range to get that to the 160 kilometers. That's just fine, but if you're using uh, like some older fiber that was higher loss, or there's a loss of vent there, like a bad connector or a splitter, let's say there's a one by eight splitter in line. And that that could have uh, a high loss there, okay, uh, like 10 dB of loss, and so that's going to eat up some of your dynamic range. And so, but if it's just a straight shot of fiber, uh, you can go 160 kilometers easily. Impressive. Uh, 
And so just one more question loaded up. Uh, will a VFL interrupt network traffic? Um, no, no. Uh, a VFL is uh, 650 nanometers typically nowadays. Um, and the the uh, in-band service wavelengths are um, 1490, 1550, perhaps 1577 if you're doing 10G now. Uh, and so those wavelengths are in band and there's filters on the ONTs and the OLTs back in the central office and whatnot uh, that uh, prevent wavelengths lower or higher from getting into the detector, if you want to call it that, and, and uh, causing um, causing issues. So a VFL will not uh, cause disruption. <laughs>